Good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. There's so much red out there. I love it. Welcome. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm Brenda Weidman, um, the Minister of Congregational Care here, and I welcome you on behalf of the congregation and the staff and uh, on behalf of everyone, whether you've worshiped with us before, whether you're a first time visitor, we welcome you. Whether you're coming across the airwaves, we welcome you and we're glad that you're here this morning. We're going to start a new sermon series this morning. I'm first on the, on the docket, so to speak, and, uh, and throughout the, the season of Lent and into Easter Sunday morning, we are going to be talking about different aspects of our resurrection faith, the tenet upon which our Christianity is based, resurrection and the new life that comes from a result of that. So I hope that you're here with us all throughout the season of Lent so that we can explore it from a lot of different directions and, and you can hear um, and, and respond to and be transformed by what resurrection faith meant to those who, who were a part of, of the early Christian community and what it means in today's world as well. We have a very busy schedule this coming week. Be aware of a number of things. Uh, first week, first of all, Wednesday is a very busy day. We have renamed it to Midweek Manna, and I love that because it says that on Wednesdays we get nourishment for our spirits and for our bodies. We have both food and we have spiritual reflection opportunities as well. Um, be aware that, uh, first of all, the Wednesday lunch, as we did on Ash Wednesday, will continue through the season of Lent, lunch and worship at starting at 1145. But also be aware that this coming Wednesday, Wednesday evening activities will resume. We did not hold those last week, but we will uh, throughout the season of Lent start again this coming Wednesday. So be sure to come at six o'clock for something to eat and then stay for fellowship, uh, for, um, for crafts, for studies, whatever, whatever it is that, um, that you would feel led to just to become a part of. Do know that there are four Lenten studies that are going on, two are in progress already, and two start this week. One starts, I believe, as of tomorrow. Um, it's an online study called Re-Lent, and the way you can become a part of that is go to our website, and there's a button that says um, FUMC Lent 2016. Click on that, and you become a part of the online discussion group. So something new and exciting to, uh, to, to, to be a part of, to, to uh, bring excitement, but maybe even a little frustration, I hope not. But, but sometimes when you're trying something new, that happens. So we'll pray that that will not happen this time. Also a second uh, Lenten study, uh, The Walk by Adam Hamilton, uh, will begin this coming Wednesday night at the same time, right after dinner, that the other studies are going on. So if that's something that, that you're being led to, uh, to, to take the walk uh, in Israel and uh, Jerusalem at this time of year with Adam Hamilton, come and join us for that study. Um, several small groups are meeting this week in addition to the Wednesday night. Uh, let's see, the Soaring Solos, Moving Forward, and the Well Shepherd Group is going to um, uh, re-resurrect. We hope this plant will resurrect. We're a little worried about this one, but that one, uh, though they're trying to, uh, to re-enliven that group. So if you're a part of that, uh, we hope you'll be here. And next Sunday, be aware that uh, if you work with children or youth, that there is a safe sanctuary training. Please stay for that. So as I said, lots going on in our church, and we hope that you will become a part of those, those opportunities. If you haven't already done so, please pass the attendance pads across, the, across your pew. Um, let us know you're here. And if you're a first-time visitor, we especially hope you will let us know you're here so that we can get to know you. Please write down your name and your contact information. And uh, we'd like to, uh, to come 
very quickly bring you a gift to say we're so glad you were with us today and that we, uh, uh, we'd like to get to know you better and here's some information about our church. So we hope that you do that if you're a first time visitor with us today. And having said all that, let us go to God in prayer as we begin our worship. Holy and gracious God, we gather this morning in your name in anticipation of the transformation and the inspiration and the revival that you will bring to us as we worship together this morning. We know where two or three are gathered. You are present with us. Be with us as we lift our voices, as we lift our hearts, as our spirits join together in praise of you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please remain standing and join me in the, our affirmation of faith this morning? This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve. 
and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Share the goodness of God with your neighbors. Greet them with the love of Christ.
Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 to 10, and 31 to 33. Listen to the word of God. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God, and his righteousness in all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ushers to come forward, please. And you know, one of the ways that we participate in the kingdom of God being realized here on earth is through our tithes and offerings. So let us give with grateful hearts this morning, knowing that our offerings, whether small or large, will help to bring God's kingdom here on earth.
gracious God, receive these our gifts and truly use them to bring your kingdom here on earth. In Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. be seated. Well, I know the first concern that you all have is whether or not Brother Jamie's back. And I've seen pictures on Facebook that he was um, in, at least in the, or I think it was the Orlando airport, they were, they were laid out on the floor asleep. But um, we are assuming that he has made it back and hopefully is resting quite well in his bed at home if he's not watching us. <laughs> so um, he is safely back. We have uh, another joy, and that is happy Valentine's Day to everybody. You know, it is the day of love, and it's not just, although we often think of it as, as romantic love, um, it's a day of love that we can spread Christ's love, we can spread love of friends, and perhaps sometimes we're remembering um, love, loved ones that have, have, have died and passed on. So it is a, a celebration uh, day of love. We also have a couple of other celebrations. We have uh, several folks that have had surgeries in our home. Jim Hudson had surgery this week, and he is home. Uh, Deb Saulfeld had surgery, and she is uh, recuperating. And then Shirley Ayer was released from uh, Health South in Fayetteville. So we are grateful for all of those, um, those uh, healings and continued healings. Today we celebrate and remember also uh, the loving memory of Liz Scarf, um, Ewart and his daughter Debbie. 
uh, gave the red and white carnations uh, in memory of, of Liz. So um, we do have a few concerns this week as well. Uh, Marlene Claff was hospitalized Friday night. Uh, she's at Washington Regional. I actually visited her yesterday, and she's doing quite well. Um, but she uh, could use your prayers. Uh, she'll have to go under, undergo some additional testing. And then uh, we have two folks coming, having surgery this week. Alan Jansen and Dwayne Hurdle will be having um, surgery this week. So if you will hold them in your prayers. Jesse Bradley's funeral service was yesterday in Little Rock. And um, uh, David Fleming uh, officiated at that service. So if you'll keep Jesse's family in your prayers as well. It's our honor and privilege to pray each week for one of our sister congregations in Bella Vista, and this week it is the Bella Vista Church of Christ. So we, in your daily prayer time, if you will lift them up, lift up their pastors and their ministries uh, and their congregation, uh, that is an incredible way that we can support one another as Christ followers uh, in our, in our uh, community. If you want a more uh, exhaustive uh, prayer list. There'll be some available at the back of the uh, sanctuary uh, when you leave. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds to go to the Lord in prayer through our prayer song. If you would care to, you may join me at the altar rail as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and amazing God, we have entered this time of Lent, these 40 days, when we are invited to look at our own lives, to see the ways in which we have missed being your faithful disciples, to see the sins that may be lurking in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we pray that you will make us aware, that you will open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, and our ears, that we may hear and see the ways that we have turned from you, that we have failed to put you first in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you will not only reveal these things to us, but that you will turn us back on the right path, that you will make room in our hearts, in our schedules, in our will. to put the things that you would have us put first. Lord, you have heard the names of the people who are in need of your healing touch. Lord, we take now a couple of moments of silence to lift up those unspoken requests and praises.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the ways that you work in our lives. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the Sundays in Lent that are many Easter's and remind us of your resurrection, where, where our hope lies. Holy One, guide us. Help us during this season to find new ways to reach out to you and to others, to truly be your hands and your feet. Lord, if that means getting them dirty, then so be it. We give you thanks for all that you are and all you have promised us. We give you thanks for your forgiveness that we know through Jesus' life, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. For it's in his name that we pray the words that he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Repent, you vile and evil creatures. Don't you know that the end is near? My goodness, Satan is within you, and your only hope is the end of time and escaping from the wickedness that you have been a part of. How many of us have heard these preachers, these doom and gloom preachers who would tell us that our only hope is to escape this world because we are wicked and vile and there's nothing here that's worth having. There have been many false prophets over the years who have, have brought this kind of a message to us. Um, there was um, Heaven's Gate Back in the late 1990s, I think, um, uh, what was his name? Applegate, I think, was his. That was where the Heaven's Gate part came from, I think. There was a comet, a beautiful comet, that appeared in the sky. And he took that as a sign that the end and times was coming. And, uh, and he encouraged um, about 40 people to follow him so that they could board what he thought was a spaceship that was coming with this comet and, and uh, to, to go, uh, go to heaven in that manner. And they all, unfortunately, committed suicide, and that was how they thought they would find their resurrection. And then there was a, a, a man whose last name was Camping. Um, what was his first name, Harold? Harold, thank you. Harold Camping, that at the age of 92, passed away by natural causes, surrounded by his family, in peace, I would hope. But he, throughout his life, numerous times, had calculated through things, verses in the Bible, through certain things he found, and he calculated and predicted that the end of the earth was going to come on this day. And that day came, and it went. And we were still here. Many times he did this. And finally, um, in uh, around 2012, he decided, okay, he'd predicted enough and he wasn't going to make any more predictions. And as I said, he passed away by natural causes. The end of the world did not come. But he thought, again, the end of the world was our only hope for resurrection. It didn't happen. 
There are folks out there even today that are looking at what they believe to be our signs that the end of the world is near. They, uh, they look at the fires and the earthquakes and, the, um, and the, the unusual weather situations, the current situation in the Middle East. Um, they look at a, a variety of things, including there are some who feel that God will use Donald Trump to usher in the end times. It's the truth. I found it on the internet. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Regardless of your politics and regardless of how you see global warming and the unusual weather patterns that we're going through and so forth and so on. To put our focus on these doom and gloom predictions as the only hope that we have for the resur resurrected life is certainly missing the mark to try to tell us that these signs and these circumstances are leading to the end time and that is our only hope for resurrection is really um, misunderstanding what Jesus coming 2,000 years ago was all about. In these predictions, there is no hope, no promise in this life. To them, the only hope and the only promise is to escape this life through the end of time. As Christians, we have a resurrection faith. And in the next several Sundays, we're going to look at what that means each Sunday in Lent and all the way up through Easter Sunday. We'll look at our resurrection faith from a different perspective. We'll look at it through the perspectives of each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we will look at it from the perspective of Paul and of Peter. And finally, on Easter Sunday, we will celebrate what that resurrection means to us as Christians. Now, most of you know that gospel means the good news. But not just any good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is what we're talking about here. Who Christ is, what his life was all about, what his teachings meant to us, and surprisingly, from our worldly perspective, what his death and resurrection meant. All of those are parts of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we might ask, okay, so what does resurrection mean? It comes from Latin. Um, re, somebody who knows Latin could do better than this, but resurgere maybe is how you say it. I'm not sure. But it means to resurge, to revitalize, to, to bring about vibrancy and purpose and new life. In Christianity, we use it to talk about Jesus' resurrection from the tomb to life again. We also use it to refer to the judgment day resurrection of the dead into heaven. But we also use it to refer to the new life that the followers of Christ have And that there is faith in this life as well as into eternity. It has an already and yet to come message to it. Our scripture today is an exchange between Jesus and Peter. Jesus knows that his death and resurrection are close. And he's trying diligently really hard to teach his disciples those they were all men those men of little faith now that did, what he meant by that was they had some faith but it was still little and he was trying 
to grow it within them. He was trying to teach them what this death and resurrection meant for them. He had just, in the, in the passage before the one I will read, he had just been talking to them and had asked them, who do you think I am? And Peter, being Peter's self, responded and said, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And with that, our scripture continues Jesus' teaching. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside. And he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How Jesus must have shaken his head once again and said to Peter and the others who were with him, they just don't get it. Peter seems to have already lost sight of what he had said just a little while ago, that Jesus was the son of the living God. A living God, walking among them, bringing new life, in ways that they had never experienced before. As soon as Peter heard Jesus say that he was going to be killed, boom, he stopped listening. He heard that human concern of dying. And at that moment, he took his eyes off the living Christ, off the living God, and he began to sink into the water. He stopped listening. He failed to hear Christ say, and on the third day, I will be raised to life. New life, resurrection. New life and resurrection are a concern of God, that living God that Peter had just spoken of just a little while ago. The good news of Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of Matthew, is that Jesus is the living God. Do we really understand what that means? Or do we leave Jesus in that tomb in our daily lives? Do we see Jesus as active and present in the things of our lives? Or is he far away? and not at all active and present. We know that scripture tells us that Jesus did come out of that tomb. We can see it on the slide. That's the rock of the side of the opening of the tomb. And Jesus is coming out of the tomb. We know that Jesus appeared first to the women, that they saw him and touched him. And he told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell the others that I am alive. The message of Matthew is that Jesus is God. But not just God, God with us. But not just God with us, the living, active, dynamic, involved in our lives, God with us. But not just the living, active God with us, but the living, active God who is here to show us and to be for us the way to overcome this world in this day and time. 
not in the end times. Christ is alive. Christ is with us. He has risen from the dead. And he calls us to be with him and to follow him and to experience the transformation and resurrection of this life, new life today. Not tomorrow at end time, but today. Jesus told Peter, and he tells us not to focus on the struggles of this earth. He says, get, when, when he says he's going to die, Peter says, oh no, that's not going to happen to you. And he says, get behind me. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to overcome death. And he tells us that in him, we are able to overcome any of the deaths of this world. He tells us to focus on things of God, God's concerns, love, forgiveness, joy, courage, strength, hope, faith, trust, peace, new life. Life, not just life, but life abundant. He says, get behind me. Another way to think of that, follow me. Walk with me. Stay close to me. And we, too, will experience the things that he has experienced. We, too, will experience resurrection and new life. Jesus came to be with us, not just to give us resurrection and escape from this world, but to show us how to be in this world and to overcome this world. You may know that I have three children, two boys and a girl. And when my youngest, Amanda, was three years old, um, I had taken, I was a teacher, and I had taken a leave of absence when she was born. And when she was about three, I went back to work. um, And life got much, much, much busier than it had been when I was home with with her and with her her older brother, who was uh, a couple of years older than that's Nate, and he's a couple years, he's the middle child, that's why, you know, like her older brother. Um, so forgive me for that. There are probably a number of you who are middle children. Before I went back to work, there was plenty of time to play, to go take a walk, to pick flowers, to go to the park and feed the ducks, lots of time to do those things. And then after I went back to work, to teaching, there just wasn't enough time to fit everything in. And she would say, Mommy, can we go to the park today? Can we go pick flowers? I want to make a a dandelion chain. And I would say, Sweetie, um, we can't do that today. We'll do that tomorrow. And then one day, I said that over and over. I know she was sick of hearing it. I know because of what she said to me later. She said something so deep and so profound and so thought-provoking, that I have never forgotten it, and she's 26 years old now. She had to tell me a number of times, and the first few times I didn't get it, (laughs) Oh, oh ye of little faith. I didn't understand what she was trying to tell me. But then one day, I understood. She said to me, Mommy, is today tomorrow? And I remember thinking, that doesn't make any sense. What is she talking about? And she said it again. Is today tomorrow? And then I felt that humbling brought to your knees with the reality of what you have been doing experience within me. And I knew what she was saying. She was saying, Mommy, We need to experience these things today, not tomorrow. Let's go to the park today. And I'm hoping that today is the day that you've been calling tomorrow in the days past. I was letting the things of this world get in the way, letting them overcome me and my relationship with her and showing her the beauty of God's creation. 
Needless to say, the day that I understood what she was trying to tell me, I dropped whatever it was that I was doing, and we went to the park, and we picked daisies, and we just had a wonderful time together. We experienced that tomorrow that I had been telling her about, but hadn't come yet in that present moment. Marianne read this morning that when Jesus taught us to pray, we, he said, pray for thy kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Strive first for the kingdom of God in the now, in the today. He didn't say, wait for the kingdom to come when we leave this earth, as the doomsday preachers would tell us. He said it's available here and now. And we have a choice. We can choose to stay in the tomb and let the world overcome us, or we can strive to find the abundant life that Christ came to bring in the present. The same way we're supposed to live into that abundant life in our final destiny. That is the good news of Matthew. That is the resurrection faith that Matthew tells us about. Jesus is with us, the living God, the living God who has come to bring the kingdom that will overcome this world. And in staying close to Jesus, we too can experience the goodness of tomorrow, the goodness of eternity in the present moment and for us, today will be tomorrow. No more do we have to wait until the end times before resurrection has come. Repent, the end is near, gets replaced by rejoice. The Lord is here with us, present, giving us new life. And yes, indeed, today is tomorrow. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, you left the tomb to bring us new life to bring us new life today in the present moment, to bring us resurrection today in the present moment, to bring us you today in the present moment. You told us that you would be with us always till the end of the age. Help us to see that you are the living God. You are with us. Help us to stay close to you and to your love, and help us to see that today is tomorrow. In your name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to sing our final hymn, we invite you. We invite you in your relationship with God to draw near got the wrong page. <laughs> Three, what is it, Judy? 301, thank you. There it is. To draw near to the cross. We invite you to become a part of a congregation of faith, of this faith family. If you would like to become a part of this faith family, we invite you to come forward by transfer of membership or profession of faith. If you would like to draw near to Christ at the cross by kneeling at the altar, we invite you to do that as well. However you're being led, please join together, stand, and we will sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross.
don't know how many of you can see it, but this plant is coming back to life. The living water that Barbara provided is bringing resurrection to this plant. What a beautiful visual message this is. We invite you to come and be a part of this congregation during the week. Wednesdays are an especially wonderful day as we, we experience spiritual and physical nourishment both at lunchtime and in the evening. Come and be a part of us. Stay near to the cross. Stay near to Christ. He came to be a part of our lives. Share that good news, that good news of the resurrection of new life that Christ brings with those you meet this week. We're not called just to come to church. We're called to be here. Amen. Go in peace.